This sermon is titled Wonderful Savior. Be enriched as you listen. Merry Christmas everyone. God bless you. So glad that we could do this, right? Um I, I don't think we can take it for granted. Our gathering together and the worshiping God together. So so glad that we could do this. So turn to your neighbor and say Merry Christmas. I'm glad that you're here. <laughs> Awesome. Praise God. Uh, before we uh, proceed, I just want to remind us about the masks um, that I just want to request all of us to wear our masks fully, uh, the entire duration of the service, please. Uh, I can see many maskless faces. So, um, so uh, okay, so if you can just, you know, wear it fully uh, for the duration of the service. And we will also fall, follow all our um, COVID protocol. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, I just want to ask us this morning, uh, how many of you texted someone and wished someone a very Merry Christmas uh, this morning? How many of you? Can I see your hands? How many of you texted? Okay. Um, or maybe you received a text. Okay. Um, do you have your hands up and with the other hand texting someone? Like, <laughs> Okay, you're all, you know, you, most of us did, right? Most of us, yeah, put your hands down, thank you. Most of us did, most of us sent a text or forwarded something and said, you know, um, yeah, wish someone a very happy Christmas. Uh, I just want to read out something, okay, about the first text message. In 1992, Neil Papworth, a 22-year-old software programmer from the UK, sent the first ever text message from a computer to his colleague, Richard Jarvis. Neil had been working as a developer and test engineer to create a short message service, SMS, for his client, Vodafone. That very first text message sent on 3rd December 1992 simply said, Merry Christmas. Neil said, in 1992, I had no idea just how popular texting would become and that this would give rise to emojis and messaging apps used by millions. I only recently told my children that I sent that first text. Looking back with hindsight, it's clearer to see that the Christmas message I sent was a pivotal moment in mobile history. So this was in 1992 that he sent his first text, and this statement, I, I, I believe, is uh, after 25 years when Vodafone kind of um, you know, recorded this. It's there on their website. So. Um, uh, you know, this statement actually caught my attention. He says, looking back with hindsight, it's clearer to see that the Christmas message I sent was a pivotal moment in mobile history. I just want to declare to us today that the Christmas, or the first Christmas, or the Christmas that we celebrate, is a pivotal moment, a significant moment in the history of mankind. How many of you agree? Uh, is the history of mankind a pivotal moment? Galatians 4 and verses 4 and 5 proclaims this. But when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. When the fullness of the time had come, when that Kairos moment had come, you know, right from creation, uh, everything was waiting for that fullness moment, fullness of time. And that moment, in that pivotal, significant moment, Christ came and God sent forth his son that we might receive redemption, that we might be adopted as sons and daughters of the Most High God. So Christmas is a very significant moment in time, the history of mankind. And from that time onwards, from that first Christmas, there, have been, there has been celebrations, traditions, and some of them with Christ in its center, at the center, and some of that uh, maybe, you know, you know, far away, far removed from Christ. But a lot of traditions, right, globally and locally. And I was just reading up a couple of traditions. You know, this is from the Armenian church. Apparently, there are some Armenian Christians who are living in Chennai and in Kol Kolkata, and... Um, well, this is the tradition. Uh, they, uh, actually, they celebrate Christmas on the 6th of Jan. Uh, uh, and on Christmas Eve, they light 
candles in their homes, which are supposed to burn through the night, right? And, uh, and then they, they do not eat uh, meat on Christmas Day. How many of you can, you know, go with that? <laughs> they do not eat meat on Christmas Day, okay? They have vegetarian meals. Okay, there's another one, you know, closer to home. This is in Atikod, near Palakkad, Kerala, uh, God's own country. So this is called, uh, you know, this is called the Moon Raja Kuth. Okay? This is a play of the three kings in Atikot. So, so here are these three uh, wise men. Or these are the three characters who play the character of the three wise men. And um, they apparently travel from a nearby village. Okay? They prepare for it with fasting and so on. And uh, their, you know, their faces are heavily made up, just like uh, the Kathakali, you know, dance, and, you know, um, heavily made up, and they have those headgear and so on. They actually travel from the nearby village and make their way to Atikod, uh, near Palakkad, and that's where they have the play, right? So this is something uh, here, and I'm sure that, you know, every family would have its own tradition, right? Um, some families, uh, you know, from, uh, I think, mom said a family, uh, they had uh, chicken soup and idli. It's a strange combination, Christmas morning. Okay, it's a, chicken soup is actually a spicy curry, watery curry, and idli. And uh, you need to watch out because idlis just keep going, you know, with that curry. And uh, I'm sure that all of you had some, you know, have some family traditions as well, right? Um, I remember, I think I shared, but uh, I remember that when we were growing up, me and my brother, we used to um, always uh, get some new clothes for Christmas. And um, dad used to, um, you know, this, these clothes were stitched, no, no, ready-mades, stitched. Um, there's this tailor called Prabha Tailors, so he'd take us there. And uh, for a long time, it was always matching, matching, me and my brother. And we were quite proud of it. You know, nowadays, I think you call it twinning. But those days, it was matching, matching. Okay. <laughs> so matching, matching went on for a season in our lives. And we were quite proud of it, wearing matching, matching. But then um, I think we realized something was not right. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, I think in our preteen years, and then, and then um, we realized we had, uh, you know, free will. <laughs> And then that was the end of that season. So we moved on from matching, matching. And, uh, you know, so, and, and also, you know, uh, just this one last tradition, you know, we used to meet on um, Christmas Eve, the night. And um, uh, I, I remember my grandfather would uh, dry these crackers, right? He used to buy the firecrackers uh, after Diwali. And they used to have some discount sale. So he'd buy that and keep it in a big trunk, large trunk. And uh, uh, the week before Christmas, he used to take it and dry it and put it out on the sun. And Christmas Eve, we'd all meet uh, their um, uh, grandfather's house, uh, have a meal together. The brother, the uh, my uncles would come and cousins, everyone have a meal together. And then would start the, you know, uh, I think it was the other way around. We would start have the firecrackers, have a bonfire, and then we'd have a meal and go for a Christmas service. And of course, we will sleep through the Christmas service because of the midnight one. And, um, you know, there was... So, you know, all these traditions, right? And sometimes what happens is that, you know, life happens, right? We move on. People are not there. The ones we knew are not there. And some traditions are dropped. And then what happens is Christmas, when you think of Christmas and all that happens around Christmas, it, it just produces an ache in your heart. You know, you miss the people, uh, you miss the traditions, and, uh, and you feel that something is missing um, because some of the traditions have moved, you know, when Christ is not at the center. I'm not saying these traditions are bad. It's good. But when, when the focus is on Christ, these traditions come even more alive, amen? When the focus is on Christ, when, when we take out Christ away from Christmas, uh, when we take the Christ away from Christmas, the focus away from Christmas, then um, it, it just becomes, we become nostalgic and we become, you know, we think about it and we, we, sometimes we become sad and maybe even depressed and so on. So this morning, we're going to look at the, the Lord Jesus, who's the Christ in Christmas, the Lord Jesus. It's just, today is just a reminder about the Lord Jesus, who is the Christ in Christmas. You know, the Christ in Christmas, 
he is the eternal one. Okay. He's the eternal one. Many times, because he was born two millennials ago on earth, we think that was the beginning. I remember having a conversation with a, with a, when I was doing my internship with an intern, and, and we were having this conversation about faith, about ancient scriptures, and uh, I remember him making this statement, you know, Jesus came much after all these other ancient scriptures and everything was there. He's, he's more recent. But when you look at the word of God, this is what the word declares. John chapter 1, verses 1 to 3 in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him, nothing was made that was made. And we go down to verse 14, and verse 14 says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So we see here that the Lord Jesus, he was in the beginning, the eternal word. He predates everything else. Right? He is the eternal one. He is the creator. The Christ in Christmas. Is the creator, the eternal one. Nothing was made that was made. Uh, and without him, nothing was made that was made. The Christ in Christmas is also the incarnate God. That's the second one. He is the incarnate God. So he is not just, you know, sometimes we think he was a noble man. He's a good man. Uh, he lived with good morals. He taught some good lessons. You know, some good management principles which we can put to practice in, in, our, in our corporates and you know, good leadership skills that we can learn from. He's a good guru. He's a good teacher. But the word of God declares who the real Jesus is. That sometimes, you know, that message gets muddled because of popular culture and, and society and so on. The real Jesus, the word of God declares in... Um, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in glory. Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. You know, that prophecy about the Lord Jesus. So he's the incarnate God, greater than you know, just any noble man or a teacher or a guru. He's the incarnate God. And that's what scripture proclaims, that Christ in Christmas is the incarnate God. The Christ in Christmas is also the Savior, the one who saves. Let's look at a couple of verses, and then we'll come back to this um, a little later. Matthew 1 and verse 21 says, And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 15, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Okay, so this verse, the previous verse, talks about something that sin does something. Sin does something to people's lives. Sin destroys people's lives. Sin takes people away from a destiny that God has for people. Sin separates people from God, and sin cannot be worked on by our own means. Right? That is what Scripture says. He will save the people from their sins, which means that people needed saving or need saving from the outcome of their sins. Right? So he, he is the one who is the Savior who has come. So the, the Christ in Christmas not only is he the eternal one, not only is he the incarnate God, but he is the Savior. 
not one of the saviors, but he is the savior. The Christ of Christmas is also the all-powerful one. You know, many times we have a picture of the baby Jesus, helpless, and weak, and we sing about it also. But he has since grown. He's the king of kings. He's the soon and coming king. He's the all-powerful one, right? Philippians 2 uh, verses 9, and 11, 9 to 11 talks about the risen Lord. And this is what it proclaims. Therefore, God has given him, sorry, God has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven, of those on earth, of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Just look at the realm that is, um, that is you know, declared. First of all, the name that is above every name, okay, the name Jesus, it also represents, the name represents authority and rank. So the authority which is above every authority, the rank which is above every other rank. Right? And it says here that at the name of Jesus, Every knee should bow. It talks about those in heaven. It talks about those on earth and of those under the earth. So just covering all realms and saying, this Jesus is the all-powerful one. He's the all-powerful one. There's nothing that's higher. There's no, one, no authority or rank that's higher than the risen Lord. The Christ in Christmas is also the soon and coming king. He's coming again. Acts chapter 1 and verse 11. Um, you know, when the disciples were gathered together and uh, after rising up, he's, the Lord Jesus is ascended into heaven and they stand there and they're looking up and he's, he's gone. And, and the two men who are there dressed in white, they ask this question. Acts chapter 1 and verse 11, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. And Revelations 19 talks about the, the coming king and it prophesies that his eyes will be like flames of fire and his, on his head many crowns and on his robe and thigh the, the title king of kings and lord of lords. He's the coming king, the Christ in Christmas. The one we rejoice, the one we celebrate is the coming king. Okay. Now coming back to the fact that the Lord Jesus is our savior. The Bible declares this, he's wonderful and he's our savior. He's wonderful, meaning that he's, he's a miracle, something marvelous. And he is our savior. Okay, we see that word in Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6, where some people say that wonderful counselor to be together. Or you know, e either ways, if you, if you look at it, he is wonderful, miraculous, something marvelous. And Matthew chapter 1 and verse 29 talks about the fact that he will save, he will save his people from their sins. And the word used there is sozo, which means to save, to preserve, to protect, to heal and deliver. Right? All of that, the Lord Jesus, the Christ in Christmas, the Christ of Christmas, will save the people from their sins. And this is what is written of him, that he is the savior, that he is the deliverer. He is a wonderful savior, a wonderful savior. Everything about him is wonderful. His love is wonderful. His love is unlike any other love. His love is, you know, if you look at it, in one sense, it was one-sided. One-sided love. Now, why do we say that? Because it says that 1 John 4, verses 9 and 10, in this the love of God was manifested towards us, that God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. Verse 10, in this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Not that we loved him, not that we reciprocated, but it is actually one-sided to begin with. He loved us. 
And he gave himself for us to be the propitiation or the amendment for atonement for our sins. His love is radical, unconditional. His love is not a because of love. You know, this morning, if you're, if you're, if you're sitting there and th saying, you know, I, I don't look good and I don't love myself and no one loves me. Well, the Lord Jesus, he has already loved you. He already loves you. Not that we loved him, but he loved us. Gave himself for us. And he, he's not looking, you know, for some performance. He's not looking at us and saying, okay, you jump through these hoops and then I will love you. No, while we were yet sinners, he still loved us. When we were enemies of God, he still loved us. He still loves us. Jesus loves us today. Amen. He loves us. You might be thinking, I'm all messed up. Jesus loves you. Well, he will not leave you in that mess. He will clear up that mess. He loves us too much to let us wallow in that mess. He loves us too much to leave us in that same place. But he, he is a redeeming love. He, lives us, he loves us and his love is agape, which is affection, benevolence. And, you know, this is one way of, of a description of this agape. It is a love feast. It is a love feast. I think we're going to spend eternity trying to find out about this love of God. For God so loved the world that he gave. It's a love feast. So his love is wonderful. Secondly, his peace is wonderful. The peace that he gives is wonderful. You know, the Lord Jesus, one of the titles that we see in Isaiah 9 is that He's called the Prince of Peace, the Master, the Lord, the Steward of Peace. And many times we, we say, I want to get away from it all. Oh, this Christmas season, yo, too much. You know, all, I think church staff will say that. <laughs> you know, like, oh man, too many things. Um, you know, and maybe everybody's having a great time and maybe at office, you know, uh, I'm just talking about you know, others also. Maybe you need to give one presentation, one training program, you know, one report. And you're like, everybody's having fun. Not fair. I wish I had some peace of mind, you know. And my mind is racing. I, I lie down and all I can see are Excel sheets and, you know, PowerPoints. And uh, I can see my boss's face and I can see, you know. I, I want some peace. My mind is like a motor, it's just never stopping. I want some peace of mind. Right? In that very storm, in that very chaos, in that very tumultuous environment, the Lord promises his peace. That's the kind of peace. His peace is wonderful. Because he's the steward, the master, the prince of peace. And look at the kind of peace that he's giving. You know, John chapter 14 and verse 27, the Lord says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. He says, my peace, the kind of peace that I walk in, I give to you. Wow. I want that. I want to walk in that. Because that kind of peace made him sleep in the storm, in the boat. That's the kind of peace that he walked in. And here he says, my peace I give to you. Not the kind of peace that the world gives. The world would say, you get away from it all. Everything has to be serene. You go away you know, on top of some mountain, some resort, and when everything is quiet, there is peace. But the Lord is saying, in the middle of the storm, you know, in the boat, when the waves are crashing, I'll give you that peace so that you can be serene. You can have that peace within yourself. And this kind of peace, the Lord says, the kind of peace that God gives is the peace that is an umpire. We are called to reign in life with this peace, which is an umpire, which causes us to make certain, certain decisions in those pressure-filled moments. It is also the peace that guards our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. The kind of peace that guards, it's just like a sentry for our hearts and minds. 
and all of us you know, the, uh, uh, can be recipients of this peace because the peace that he gives is wonderful. Well, thirdly, his love is wonderful, his peace is wonderful, his forgiveness is wonderful. Amen? His forgiveness is wonderful. Romans 5 and verse 8, but God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Ephesians 4, 32 talks about this and says, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Even as God in Christ forgave you. And that's the kind of forgiveness that he's extending to you and I today. God in Christ, while we were yet sinners. And today, that forgiveness is available for each one of us. Whether you're a believer, a follower of the Lord, or maybe you're considering following the Lord, uh, or maybe you know, you're far away from the Lord, that forgiveness is available today. That can be ours today. And with that forgiveness, you know, the best part is this. We can reach out and extend that forgiveness to others around us. We can extend the same forgiveness, meaning that we can forgive others the way he forgave us. When we receive that forgiveness, when we are empowered by that forgiveness and love, we can forgive others the way he forgives us. So that forgiveness is available for us today. His forgiveness is wonderful. And fourthly, his power is wonderful. Christ in Christmas, his power is wonderful. Let's look at this verse, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 19 and 20. It says, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. The exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe. Okay, so his power is directed towards us who believe. And it says the exceeding greatness of his power. You know, uh, I know that many of us need his power in our lives. Saying, I'm powerless. I'm powerless to solve this. I'm powerless to sort this out. I'm powerless to come out of this. I feel imprisoned. Right? And here we see this is the greatness, exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his mighty power. Acts chapter 10 and verse 38 talks about how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil for God was with him who went about doing good. He was anointed with the Holy Spirit and with power. So this power which causes good things to happen, this power of God which causes healing to happen, which causes the works of the enemy to be broken in our lives, in the lives of our family members, in, in our environment, the, the power of the enemy to be broken by the power of God, this power is directed towards us, is available for us, those who believe. And the Lord Jesus wants us to walk in this kind of power. So his power is wonderful. And lastly, his salvation is wonderful. His salvation is truly wonderful. And God so loved us that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes should not perish, but have everlasting life. This salvation is truly amazing. It's truly wonderful. He's come to break the power of sin over our lives. He's come to break the power of oppression of Satan in our lives. He's come to break the subjection of Satan who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He's come to give us peace and meaning and purpose. He's come so that 
he can reach us and we cannot reach him with our own trying and striving, but he has come to reach us. He has come with his love to pursue us. The power of sin and Satan broken and um, he has come so that he could pay for the sin. He could pay for what is holding us back. He could pay for what is uh, imprisoning us and deliver us and be with us, that he can be Emmanuel, God, with us. You know, if there's anyone here and you have not really received the Lord or not really experienced the salvation, you know, been, maybe this is your first time in church, you, know, you can go ahead and say, today, I want things to change. Today, you know, I'm going to invite and experience, invite Jesus into my life and experience the salvation. Or maybe you've been walking with Jesus many years and somehow, you know, this whole thing of Christmas and, and everything seems to be so jaded because we've seen things around and uh, somehow we've lost that wonder of Christmas. We've lost that wonder of that wonderful Savior because we've moved away maybe from the Christ in Christmas. Or maybe all our traditions and everything, uh, good things, you know, definitely. But without Christ at the center, it has really become, you know, uh, jaded and empty maybe. But for us, we can come back, maybe put an end to that willful sin, put an end to that stubborn addiction, lay down the guilt and pain and regret, and disappointment, and maybe, you know, the approval of people, things has taken precedence and replaced the approval that we want from God. But today, we can allow our hearts to be recaptured by this wonderful Savior. Allow ourselves to be recaptured by the love of the wonderful Savior. Allow our lives uh, to be forgiven by this wonderful Savior. Allow our lives to, to experience the power of this wonderful Savior. And allow our, ourselves to experience the love, the power, the forgiveness, the salvation of this wonderful Savior. And and put that wonder back into Christmas again. Put that wonder back into Christmas again so that you're saying, hey, I, I'm celebrating Christmas. You know, uh, and, and it's not just I'm nostalgic about the past or you know, I'm, I'm, I'm missing the people that I, uh, the, who used to be there with all those celebrations. Well, there, there could be the pain, but, but really, since it's about Jesus and since it's about this wonderful Savior, you know, we can recapture that, um, that wonder of Christmas. Amen? So um, let's do that. We're just going to spend some time worshiping the Lord. And I just request the worship team to come up. Um, and, uh, and we're going to spend some time just praying and saying, Lord, uh, I just want to be restored. I, I want to recapture that wonder. And those of us, maybe we've never accepted Jesus or we've started, we've never, you know, started walking with Jesus, invited Jesus into our lives, we can do that as well. Okay, while well, the worship team is sitting up, um, why don't we just talk to the Lord? And just ask, I just want to request you to just bow your heads and just talk to the Lord. And um, maybe you just want to sing out a song to him. Into my heart, into my heart, come into my heart, Lord Jesus, come in today, come in to stay. You know, if it's your first time in church, maybe someone invited you, you can sing this prayer. Say, into my heart. Now can we all sing it? Into my heart. Into my heart. Come into my heart. Lord Jesus, come in.
Yes, Lord, touch our minds, touch our bodies, heal us. I could search for all eternity, Lord. Stand up and worship the Lord. thank him and praise him say lord i thank you because you are my wonderful savior i thank you for your love today oh god yeah, yeah. i thank you for your love today oh lord yeah. the wonders of your of your love, oh God, the wonders of your love, Lord, the wonders of your love, yes, God, we thank you, Lord, the wonders of your love, we have seen, we have heard, we experience, oh God, the of your love. Yes, Lord, we thank you that you reach out to us with your love, God. We, we reach out to us, Lord, with compassion, God. Oh, God, we thank you. We thank you, Lord. And Lord, we reach out to you with our needs, God, this morning. For we know that we can come before you 
Because your ears are always open, God. And your eyes are always open, Lord, to our cries. And so we come, Lord. We bring our needs and we place them before you. Wonderful Savior. The one who loves, the one who heals, the one who forgives. Oh God, we come. Mm-hmm, yeah. The wonders of your love. Thank you, thank you, Lord. The wonders of your love. Something marvelous, miraculous. Oh God, the wonders of your love. Oh God, yeah. Oh, the wonders of your love. Yes, Lord, every heart and heart, oh God, they soft by your love because you reach out with your love and your compassion, God. You see us in the filth and the scum, oh God, and yet you reach out, Lord, because you are Emmanuel, God, with us. You never leave us, never forsake us, God. You are with us all the time, oh God. We thank you. We thank you for that love. We thank you for that love. You know, let his love not be one-sided. Let his love not be one-sided. The Bible says that while we were yet sinners, he loved us. Um, You know, we didn't consider him. Not that we loved God, but he loved us. You know, this morning, can you say, Lord, I take that step to love you. I I don't understand everything about you, God. I don't understand everything, but you love me. And so this morning, I come and I take that step. I make that choice. Because love is a choice. And you can say, God, Lord Jesus, I love you. I love you, Lord. Heal my heart, Lord. Heal my body, O oh God. Come into my heart. Come into my life. Change me. Mm, oh, the wonders of your love. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, the wonders of your love. Joy unspeakable. But we have the Lord you now turn our sorrows into joy. Uh, may he turn our sorrow into joy. May he turn our mourning into dancing. Amen. The Lord is well able to do that. Even as you invite him and allow him to do that in your life. Amen. Amen. Um, just a small word. Uh, maybe there's someone here you know, who's been who's been kind of running with the pack, you know, um, running with the pack, meaning you know, approval of the people who are with you, and you've been running with the pack, and, and then this running with the pack and this um, running with the herd has really, uh, you know, that it's not cost you good, but it's really taken you away. And um, uh, many times you've thought about it, but, but you've not really been able to make that choice, make that decision. To uh, This running with the pack has really isolated you from family. Is a, it has distanced you from what is good, and, and you know it. And um, today you can make that choice, you can make that decision um, to run in the other direction. To run towards Jesus. You know, this for someone, maybe you can start running towards Jesus. Running towards Jesus. Just open that door, make that choice, and run towards Jesus. And we just want to give an opportunity for someone to, for anyone to, to invite 
Jesus into your heart. You know, we've you know, mentioned that over and over again, but if there's anyone and you've never really invited Jesus into your heart, um, you can pray this prayer and say, Lord Jesus, come in to my heart, come into my life, forgive my sins. I believe that you died for me on the cross. I believe that you rose again. So come into my life and make me your child. I'm running towards you, Jesus. And if there's anyone who prayed that prayer, you know, just want to see your hands, please. If you can put it up and we just want to pray with you. Pray that prayer for the first time. If there's anyone, maybe you are watching online, if you had prayed that prayer for the first time and said, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Um, can you please put your hands up? just want to pray with you. Is there anyone? Anyone? Okay. Okay. Right. For those of you who are watching online, maybe you've made that prayer for the first time, you can write in to us and um, just help you get started with your life with Jesus, journey with Jesus. Okay, before we close, just uh, uh, one small announcement. And I um, um, just want to thank the family um, that has um, sponsored the cakes, Christmas cakes for all of us, and have made the arrangement for all of us. So the Christmas cakes will be served as you and through those main exits. And um, these are individually packed cakes, and you can pick it up on your way out. So we just want to thank the family as well. Um, yeah, let's, let's close. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us and remain with us both now and in the days ahead. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you for listening. We trust this message was a blessing to you. For more free resources, including sermons, sermon notes, publication, please visit apcwo.org. For information on APC Bible College in Bangalore, please visit apcbiblecollege.org. Please remember to download the All People's Church Bangalore app from the app or Google Play Store.